literary luminary for the last somehow four or five decades. 35 years of teaching at UC Berkeley. He was currently a professor at California College of the Arts. He's the author of probably the best known work um, of American fiction that he was produced is uh, Mumbo Jumbo. And we'll be saying a little bit more about that book to be sure. He's also the author of numerous poems, essays. Um, there's the collection that comes to mind. Writing is Fighting. He has a long history of infusing social activism and progressive ideas into his work. And I'm um, delighted to have him here this morning. To his left is Professor Ianthe Brodigan Swenson. And she is here in the Hutchins School of Liberal Studies teaching for us, as well as she is the School of Arts and Humanities Internship Coordinator. She is the author of Can't Catch Death, her daughter's memoir about her father, a very, very famous 1960s writer by the name of Richard Brodigan. And so we're going to be hearing some of her insights into the writing of the memoir, I hope, and also about the literature of the city. This is the title of our panel, trying to bring as many Bay Area people together as we possibly could in this panel. To Ianthe's left is Professor Jonah Raskin, who's Emeritus Professor of Communication Studies at Sonoma State University. He taught here also several how many decades? Three, three decades as well. Um, and the author of numerous books about California, authors ranging from Jack London um, to the very famous um, poem written by Allen Ginsberg, Howell. Um, he's written um, Fugitives, Exiles. I'm going to get your title wrong, but a lot of collection about um, many, many California. Uh, immigrants to the scene here, and um, currently still writing. In fact, I have um, Jonah is kind enough to give me periodically some of the pieces that he's producing, and he gave me one um, just a few days ago, which actually brings together our three panelists here in a really wonderful way. So this was written 26 years ago. It's called Rapping with Ishmael Reed. It was an interview that. Jonah did with uh, Mr. Reed here. And I'd like to read just a little bit because it brings in actually all. Might be just a tiny one paragraph. <laughs> The walls of his third floor study are covered with sketches and posters of Muhammad Ali, Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, and Sugar, Wh Sugar Ray Robinson. One of Reed's prized possessions is a framed front page of the July 4th, 1919 edition of the Daily News that depicts Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries' fight, a gift from his friend, Richard Brodigan. Quote, I admire black boxers because they confront the world that's hostile to race, Reese says. The ring is like the battleground that the black person has to go through every day. Boxing is an existential drama in which the fighter expresses his eloquence with his fists. He can be crowned the champ or he can pay with his own life, unquote. Though he arrived on the West Coast more than 20 years ago, although now we would say something like 46 years ago, Reed still feels that he's in exile. And in large part, that's the way he wants it. Quote, if I had stayed in New York, I probably would have had a comfortable existence as a celebrated black writer, he says. But I wouldn't have written as much as I have here. Anonymity in Oakland keeps me angry and creative. So, so I love I love that I have ha holding me holding in my hand here the connection. So a, an interview done by Ishmael Reed, by Jonah Raskin about Ishmael Reed, in which 
your father's mentioned in terms of giving giving a nice photograph there. So our, our, our procedure here today is I have a few questions and I'll be directing them to our to our panelists and it would be great to have a you know an answer from each of you but then really try to open it up and have a nice discussion with the theme of the literature of the 60s and we we're down to two mics so we'll be doing a little bit of back and forth mic swapping. Okay. Um, I also want to mention to you before we get started that Professor Reed will be doing a Q&A discussion, a little bit more informal chance to get up close and personal with us in Schultz 3001 this afternoon from 1.30 to 2.30. So if you have that block in your schedule, bring a sandwich, um, drop by, and um, it's going to be a, a really nice gathering. Okay. Um, so I think first for, for Ishmael. So your novels, and okay, I'm really prepared. I'm so prepared that I wrote up which is a little obsessive, but bear with me. So your novels from everything from The Freelance Pallbearers, which was your first one that got into print, to Mumbo Jumbo, Flight to Canada. Your novels, actually, I want to say, they affect me in a way that they were so hip and so postmodern, actually, before we really had postmodernism. Um, Mumbo Jumbo, for example, is incredibly multi-genre. There are photographs, different typefaces, different voices in this novel. Um, and for those of you who don't know it, let me just um, give you the thumbnail sketch. This is going to be a long question. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so the thumbnail sketch is here. It's really, it's really about black culture coming into the United States as a foundational, we're talking about cultural matrices here, um, or disciplinary matrix, black culture as a founding fabric of the United States. And so the novel is beginning in around 1890, 1890s with jazz in New Orleans, and something takes over people. Um, their, their sensibilities become altered when they hear jazz. And it's unstoppable. It's irrepressible. They can't help it. They start dancing in the streets. They start clapping hands. They start singing along. And this thing just grew. Started in New Orleans, and it went north, went to Chicago, went to New York, and it just grew. And there's a fear among the white establishment, the mainstream, we talk a lot about Freemasons and sort of the powers that be, the founding fathers. There's a fear that, oh my goodness, we're going to be overtaken by something that we don't quite understand, and it's so seductive and so impassioned that we don't know what we're going to do with one another. So, um, so we got to somehow repress it. So it's this wonderful tension throughout the novel of pockets of Jess Drew that just get people to, even unbeknownst to themselves, they, they are taken over by the rhythm. Um, and so I guess my, so my question to you is, um, you know, you've done so much literary innovation here. In fact, the novel even starts before you get to the title page. So, I mean, he's playing with dis disrupting genre and so forth. Um, can you say a little bit about how you got started experimenting with this kind of multi-genre fiction? Thank you very much. <clears throat> can you hear me? <coughs> Excuse me. This is my uh, third trip to Sonoma, and originally I was invited by David Brummage, the, uh, your late professor, and uh, so um, this is becoming a commute, right? I got up here faster than before because your dean's uh, driving talent, but uh, we were all looking for a different way of telling stories. Uh, formalistically, uh, most novels could be written by the same person, formalistically. So Richard Brodigan and some of <clears throat> Thomas Pynchon and other writers were trying to find a new approach to writing a novel. I was very much influenced by painters because uh, those, uh, those painters whom I knew in New York were collages. And so I think I've been experimenting with the collage uh, since that time. Uh, also, it was impossible to write a linear novel surrounded by some of the uh, creators in the Lower East Side of New York, musicians, painters, uh, and other uh, writers. But I used a uh, liberal arts school 
uh, as a trade school. And I think I stayed probably two years too long. I could have gone to New York, <laughs> learned how to write. But I encountered uh, Ezra Pound. I was influenced by Ezra Pound, which is, has led me to write in three languages, but most recently in Hindi. And uh, I was influenced by w uh, William Butler Yeats and his uh, anti-colonial mythologies, the Celtic revival, which led me to a different view of Europe. I've been to Europe many times. My first trip was 17 years old, younger than some of you. And uh, Mumbo Jumbo is influenced by the Celtic revival, my idea of neo-Hudaism, the search for a sort of like uh, anti-colonial or, or pre-colonial uh, system was influenced by uh, Yeats, although he abandoned uh, the Celtic revival uh, in his uh, later years. Uh, so, and Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, who wrote a collage, you know, the Wasteland is a collage. Uh, many people consider Eliot a Western poet. I never hear the term Western civilization when I go to Europe. But here, here, you know, the overseas settler colony, they use terms like that. But, uh, you know, Robert Frost criticized uh, uh, Eliot for not writing an original line. You, you, know, you know, so grab, paste. Our stuff is like uh, paste and sampling, like the hip hoppers. We were doing that before, uh, before, before the hip hoppers. As a matter of fact, the hip hoppers are our, our uh, uh, descendants. So uh, I learned, I studied all this, I studied Joyce taught me economy in the Dubliners. So uh, I knew all this during the first two years at the University of Buffalo, and uh, then went to New York, or should have, should have gone to New York then, I stayed too long. Um, so the 1960s in New York was a very fertile ground. I was in New York last month and I had to pay $1,700 for an apartment, just to rent an apartment, that in the old days we paid $60 for. You know, we could live on maybe three dollars a day. Like we get a condition, some Ukrainian cabbage soup. So, I think that that sort of New York is gone. Um, so, uh, uh, I I think uh, I'll end by saying that uh, my idea of postmodernism is extending the experiments of the modernists. For example, and I think you can apply this to music too. Anthony Brown's Pan-Asian Orchestra followed Duke Ellington's uh, Oriental Suite by using the precise instruments, the, the actual instruments, and using the actual scales. Uh, so he elaborated, or he continued the experiments of Duke Ellington, a modernist, okay? Matter of fact, uh, the, uh, Duke Ellington's harmonies are still avant-garde, although he was influenced by the French. Um, Richard Wright wrote haiku in uh, English. I've written a couple of haiku in uh, Japanese. Uh, Ralph Ellison uh, showed his editor, Jason Epstein, what Monk was doing on the piano. I can play Monk. I play Monk's tunes. So that's how I see uh, postmodernism as an extension of the uh, experiments of the modernists, maybe without the elitism and the fascism. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you, likewise, could you speak a little bit about the literary disruptions that your father was engaged in, in trout fishing in America, in watermelon sugar? So um, my dad came down from the Pacific Northwest uh, drawn to the Beats. And the Beats were influenced by a lot of the authors that uh, Ishmael was just talking about, Pound and, um, and Eliot um, and, and Yeats. So, what, so my dad came from, he, was not, he never attended college. Um, and so he was very much an outsider. But San Francisco... Um, if you describe the East Coast and the West Coast, San Francisco's kind of horizontal. East Coast is vertical. It's very difficult to get access. And the literary world 
is kind of cloistered. And whereas West Coast, you could come to San Francisco and hang out at Gino and Carlos or uh, City Light Books and somebody would read your poetry. And it's still true to this day. San Francisco and Oakland, this area is more accessibility as far as if you're a writer coming in. So my dad came down living in a car, uh, no money, super shy, super tall, but he had been writing since high school. And uh, he saw the world in a really different way. Um, and his poetry, I don't, have you guys, I don't know if you've read any of his work. Has anybody read any of his stuff? <laughs> okay, well, take a look at some of his things. His poetry is very accessible. Um, there's a poem right now that's making the rounds called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. He kind of foresaw the computer, what's happening right now with computers. Um, it love poem, uh, I'll just recite it. It's so nice to wake up in the morning and not have to tell someone you love them when you don't love them anymore. So he was very quick. Um, he, he believed that language was compression. But he was totally an outsider. So he came to the Bay Area um, and was influenced by, uh, by Robert Duncan, uh, Ginsburg, uh, but he was not a beat in that sense. So I think the most interesting thing about what made him possible, because he wasn't college educated, so he didn't have that inroad, he did not have financial connections, he wasn't a trust fund baby, um, he had nothing. But what he did have was an extraordinary imagination and a mimeo machine. And he, they got into this idea of self-publishing. So my mom would work down in the financial district and collect their little bit of money. And that what they ended up doing was self-publishing books. And City Lights books, because Lawrence Berlinghetti had created, you could literally self-publish down there. And it created this inroads. So trout fishing in America came up through, it didn't come, it didn't go to a big publisher past scrutiny. It came up through um, the folks living in San Francisco. And there was a copy, Billy Collins, the poet, said that, you know, trout fishing was making the rounds. In, they would say, oh my God, there's this incredible manuscript. You've got to read this. It's just like Alice in Wonderland. It's like going down the rabbit hole. And you can have the manuscript for two hours, but you've got to give it back to me. So, um, and then what happened was that you had, you could have access to, um, Ishmael Reed was talking about inexpensive things. So you had churches, and people could go read their works. So, so they would go, and they would have these big readings with Gary Snyder and Robert Duncan and for, um, Philip Whalen and all these, all these different writers. You had, and a lot of uh, young people like yourself really interested in this new kind of writing which was accessible. You didn't have to have somebody explain it to you you could read it and go, whoa, and have your, you know, and, and, and come into it. Um, and at the same time, getting away from what somebody called, um, I had a friend who said, a lot of American literature sometimes is vaguely dissatisfied people from the suburbs whose children are mad at them. <laughs> so getting away from that kind of odd kind of, and I would say classist writing, and into the imagination. And um, so I'm going to leave it at there. Yes, I have a question for you, Jonah. So you've written a lot on the 1960s on California authors and on California subcultures. American Scream, um, Allen Ginsberg, and the making of the Beat Generation, For the Hell of It, Life and Times of Abby Hoffman and your own autobiography, Out of the Whale, Growing Up in the American Left. Um, those, those books especially come to my mind. And you have mentioned to me you were in college during this era of the 1960s. So when you think about that writing, um, what would you want this audience of Searcy students to understand about the writing of the 1960s? And maybe the era itself. Uh, well, um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I do feel that this is a little bit too sedate for me up okay. here, you know. Um, it, it, that I would maybe start off by saying that if we were uh, on a panel in the 1960s, we, we would 
very likely be using different language than we're using now. I mean, I, for example, might say, you know, up against the wall, motherfucker. You know, <laughs> uh, or, or uh, I might quote some slogans from various different organizations of the time, like uh, off the pig or, or ho, 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 chi men, NLF is going to win. I would, be, I would be likely to bring the language of the street into the classroom and onto the college campus. So um, I, I would say that I, um, I hate the 60s. I, 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 or at least I hate the 60s of myth. The 60s have been tremendously mythologized. It's very difficult to to give people like an idea uh, who were not there uh, of what was going on and, and how people were living because it has been depicted so often in film, it's on TV, it's, it, and, and so like if, you, if people ask you know, me what I was doing in the 60s <clears throat> and if I don't mention the fact that I was doing drugs and having sex and listening to rock and roll, they think, no, you couldn't have been there, you know. So you have to talk about sex and drugs and rock and roll and revolution if you're going to talk about the 60s. But then you have to get beyond those kind of, like, the cliches of, of all that. So um, uh, I, have, I, I know I said that I hate the 60s, but I said the, also that the... I, I feel uncomfortable with the myth of the 60s. I feel uncomfortable with my friends who want to get together and say, do you remember that party we went to in 1967 and, and, and Tommy took off his clothes and, and dropped a bunch of acid? And, and, and you know, well, I, I'm sorry, I don't really want to go into that. Forget about it. You know, can we move on, can we move on please? Um, so, but I'm also very, I'm a child of the 60s. I was shaped by the 60s. I, I think it's very important to realize that there's the chronological 60s that began in 1960 and ended in 1969. And there's also the 60s as a state of mind that went beyond the chronological decade and that's still alive. You can still find... Uh, pockets of the 60s and there are still people who are living by the 60s just as there's, there's still a beat generation. The beat generation didn't end uh, with Jack Kerouac's death in 1969. And the, you know, the beats were alive and well all, th all through the 1960s. So uh, I'll stop there. Up against the wall, motherfuckers. <laughs> Um, do, you, do you both want to respond? To, to We were talking a little bit before about, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for injecting that necessary I also subversive wanna, element. I also want to say that the phrase that I just used, which I believed was in a Leroy Jones play, was first used by police officers who arrested African Americans and said to them, up against the wall, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And then it was adopted by other people. So we, we learned everything from the police. Okay. Okay. The only thing, the only thing that I'd like to say is, is this, so the panel right now can go into two directions. We can go into social, like social things or that kind of thing, or we can go into writing. I, you know, um, I, I don't know. I was, I, I mean, my dad didn't do drugs. He drank, but he didn't do drugs. He wasn't, he, oh, of course, of course. But he wasn't dropping acid and doing that kind of stuff. However, he did write a wonderful poem about uh, VD, uh, the butcher, the baker, the, the candlestick maker, everybody can get VD, get yourself checked out. Um, so there definitely was that whole idea of provocativeness. But um, I think that um, that what he was interested in, uh, he was interested in the diggers, and they were interested in providing free things for people and free food and free meals and free meals in Golden Gate Park to feed the kids that had come 
um, kind of led by the Pied Piper for the Summer of Love and got here and were hungry and strung out. So um, he was interested in that. And it was and outrageous events like the Invisible Circus, which if you look that up, it's, it's an, it was an amazing event that took place at Glide Memorial Church. Um, but um, I think that he was really interested in writing. That's what he did. Um, and he hung out with Bruce Conner, the artist, um, Gary Snyder, Michael McClure, and they were interested in creating events that had to do with writing and artwork, and, but they were very unusual. And sometimes they ended with people taking their clothes off um, because nudity, I mean, I, as a child of the 60s growing up in that era, it was like, put your clothes on, please. <laughs> but not all events, you know, people were taking their clothes off. So I'm just saying that his thing was about art. So that was where he was heading. That was what he was always interested in. <clears throat> I think uh, Jonah's right. A lot of the features of the uh, 1960s have been commercialized. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, a cartoonist who, uh, named Emery Douglas who um, was a Black Panther, wrote for the Black Panther newspaper. And he's the one who uh, depicted the police as, as pigs, one of those. As a matter of fact, the Yippies ran a pig for president. You call that before the pigs we have. <laughs> no, we long before the ones we have now. Um, his uh, his uh, cartoons were on exhibit at a very fancy museum in New York uh, located downtown. And uh, Rizzoli, one of, the, one of the most prestigious uh, publishers in Italy, uh, published a volume of his, uh, his work. I was sitting in a theater in New York, a movie house, and they introduced uh, the concessions, the popcorn and uh, Cokes, with a quote from Howell. And uh, a $50,000 Chrysler car shows a middle-aged man quoting on the road, which I never saw as a jazz uh, prose. I know there's a lot of hype about jazz poetry and jazz this and that. I'll tell you what, man, I've been studying jazz for about 20 years. It's a very difficult discipline. Just like, just like uh, you know, flippantly, people use uh, Buddhism. We had a magazine called Yardbird Reader, one of the first multicultural magazines out here. We had a, a Buddhist write a satire about uh, North Beach of Buddhism. He said it takes 35 years to create a, <laughs> create a Zen priest, and you don't sit around all day in a, in a coffee shop or a tavern as a Buddhist priest. And when I went to Japan, the people over there were very surprised that Gary Snyder never learned Japanese. So there, there were a lot of those. I, I recall Kenneth Rexroth has a scene in one of his books where all these uh, Kerouac or somebody comes in and he starts talking about Dharma. And there are all these uh, experts on uh, Buddhism there looking at him. You know? So I think, I think that uh, I think you really have to, I don't want to be very charitable. I think you really have to, to uh, give people like the Beats the uh, images and others, not the you know, turn of the century images movement, you have to give whites credit for attempting to step out of what they call over here Eurocentrism. You know, in Europe, most of a lot of those people <laughs> come from Europe. <laughs> like in Hungary, people come from Turkey. But you have to give them credit for stepping out of this little Eurocentric thing that they have over that they call over here, which I always compare to like uh, being a big chicken in a small cage. You know. Like, how they breed those chickens, where, you know, in this, in, I think the, the uh, yeah, right, right. The, I think the animal cruelty, well, I think that's the Eurocentric point of view, which is cripple, cripple American intellectual life. That's why we came up with something called multiculturalism uh, in California, because the East was black and white, okay? So when I came out here, I understood, I met a people who belong to a tradition that goes back to the 1700s. For example, we have aristocrats here who came to California in 1776. And so when Chicanos go to the uh, Boston, those places they, they places, they call that the new capital because the Spanish had a capital down in Santa Fe, still there, the governor's house. Uh, I met Asian Americans. Uh, we had no tradition or no experience with Asian American literature or anything like that. So we formed a coalition. 
which was sort of like a reaction to uh, a um, the Beats, which was like sort of like an old boys club, you know, sort of like the Bohemian uh, counterpoint to uh, to uh, what's that that program Mad that guy on Mad Men, you know, sort of like the Bohemian version of that. Although the Mad Men nowadays dress like Bohemian, they dress like Ginsburg, they go to go to work. Uh, so uh, you know. I, so, so I give credit to the Beats. I give credit to Gary Snyder and a number of the other writers who's tried to step out of this cocoon, this little Linus towel or whatever you call it, a little uh, you know, security blanket that they call Eurocentrism. And here again, I just came from a conference in uh, Mulhouse, France, where they, people were talking about they, they wanted their dialects, they wanted their languages. There's no consensus about what Western civilization is in Europe. I hate to tell you that. They had a conference where, uh, you know, they were saying, well, maybe we'll use U Ulysses as uh, the uh, guiding, uh, you know, European myth. Well, the Greeks didn't, the Greeks still call Europe the, the West. <laughs> so when the Greeks go to England, they said, we're going to the West. So, so they're more comfortable with Africa than with, uh, so, I mean, you, there's a lot of mythologies that are coming down because we have this overseas, like they had in Rhodesia and places like we have this overseas colony that has fantasies about the homeland, which doesn't think so. So I think uh, uh, I want to give credit to Marion Moore and to Chicago and tra their translate the translations of Native American literature. I want to give uh, credit to Amy Lowell, who brought the haiku from Japan. I want to give credit to all those people because they could just be comfortable like the contemporary writers and live in this sort of like old boys club. And I, I just want to end by saying, you know, our leading novelists are bigots. I mean, it's crazy. The, the, the people whom we uh, honor, and one of them even got the Nobel Prize. You know, they have terrible ideas about women, uh, terrible ideas about blacks, Hispanics. I mean, uh, you know, I, and I was very disillusioned by this because one of the reasons I went to New York to become a writer is because I was following the example of Norman Mailer and James Baldwin, whom I met. I met Mailer, fresh off the boat. Ethel, you know, coming down to New York, I see Mailer coming to places, the greatest writer since Chaucer, because I married them and went to his parties. And, you know, you can do that in New York. But then he turned right wing. He started talking like Buchanan. He wrote this thing called Fire on the Moon that hurt my feelings because he said blacks were considered, were impotent because whites had put, uh, you know, were in the space travel. Some of the the, the, the the scientists who's responsible for Shepard going up to the his flight was a black woman. You know? Head of the Jupiter Commission, one of the directors of the Jupiter Commission commission was a black woman. The former uh head of NASA was a black man, you know? And so that sort of hurt my feelings when some of these writers went right. And I say it more out of a sadness. I mean Tom Wolf. You look at Tom you know Tom Wolfe, the, the writer, wrote Bonfire Fan, this evil book, Bonfire of the Vanities, which considered so great. If you look at the at the excuse me, the catalog of the American Nazi Party, his book is on there because I say, wow, here's Tom Wolfe on their catalog. And I think he belongs there. So I'm just wondering what's happening if you have the academic or an intellectual elite sounding like the Tea Party. I mean, they use bigger words. They have a, a larger vocabulary, but I find a lot of similarity between the attitudes of the, the, uh, the white uh, cultural movement. And, uh, and there are a lot of exceptions. I mean, Richard Brodigan was a great exception. I think if all the white men in, the, in this country could be like Richard Brodigan, we'd have any problems. We would not be occupying any, any of these countries, you know, the police would not be going around beating up people and shooting them, you know, if all white men were like Richard Brodigan. So what did Richard Brodigan do? He didn't say, this stuff is politically correct. If I read this book, I'll be contaminated with political correctness. I gave uh, Richard Brodigan books by African American authors. Next time I saw him, he was quoting from them. He was quoting from them. So that's what you students have to be. We're coming to the end of the domination 
of American civilization. And don't believe that the Puritans were the first storytellers. There are stories that go back thousands of years in this continent, okay? So we're coming to the end of, of, the, of what you might call ersatz or, or pseudo-European culture dominating. And some people are going to fight it out. Other people are voting for President Obama. So there's a civil war going, among, going on in white America between those who can live with diversity and those who can't. That's, that's why the Tea Party's there. That's why the, the Congress vetoes or resists everything that President Obama wants to do. And that's why people still call the president's family monkeys and whores and sluts and crack, call the, call the daughters crack daughters, you know? So we're coming to the end. And this is great. No culture will dominate the others, you know? People will maybe start to find out where they came from. My friend, I, I'm, I'm going to end right here. My friend Dan Cassidy, a real intellectual, my late friend Dan Cassidy, you know, he wrote a book called How the Irish Invented Slang. You know, he said he talks to kids with names like Fitzgerald and O'Toole or something like that. They don't know where they came from. We had uh, 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 Jerry Adams of Sinn Féin uh, come to the University of California, Berkeley. This is Irish kids. They don't know what he's talking about. So I think uh, if we look at where we came from, we'll know where we're going. And maybe stop all this uh, tension and be open-minded to look at other people's works and other people's cultures without dismissing them as uh, politically correct. I just wrote a piece of Washington Post where I say that every parrot owner should teach their parrots, their birds, political correctness. Maybe they'll, that'll do, uh, end it, okay? Yeah, I mean, that uh, I was, we were talking before this about the bleaching out of the black contribution to the 1960s and a, like a systematic decade after decade bleaching out. Um, so Theodore Rosak's groundbreaking book, which he wrote in the 1960s, The Making of the Counterculture, which just has nary a word about a black, about black culture, um, the subversive elements, um, realizing that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. You've got to find your own tools. And that, that actually feeds into another one of my questions that I had, like the role of humor. Um, a lot of your work, Ishmael, in particular, is really outrageously funny, um, sardonic, parodic, um, turning the tables on, on the powers that be. And um, I wonder if you would speak, and then maybe anybody else who wants to speak about the role of humor. Jonah, look like you want to jump in there at some point and give us some more subversive language. Uh, but you, you, <laughs> you want to. Well, yes, uh, uh, definitely. It was a lot, uh, I would say the 60s was definitely a time of great, you know, political satire. Uh, um, in the 50s, one of the things that was dominant about the 60s was that people were terrified of nuclear war and at atomic bombs going off. And it was a good way to keep everybody scared. And they used to have exercises where you get under your desk and you duck and you cover because uh, the bomb is going to fall and people were really scared of it. And, and one of the things that differentiated the 60s was uh, that... that uh, people started to laugh at the idea of nuclear war and nuclear apocalypse. What, what else can you do but laugh at it? It's like absurd and like a movie like a Dr. Strangelove uh, uh, or, or there was a cartoon in The Realist and there's a man walking on the street and, and, and somebody asks him, you know, what would you do if like uh, uh, the bomb went off right now and the guy says, I'd take a shit. So, you, you know, so there was something like, like irreverent about the about the hum, the humor of the 1960s so uh, to to continue with what Ishmael was saying uh, about uh, uh, the end of of uh, European or Western civilization I would say that the 60s was 
uh, the time in the 20th century when a whole generation became aware that there was something totally bankrupt about the civilization that had created nuclear weapons and that was just b bombing all over the world and, and that there were other civilizations that had all, also all over the world that had long and noble and traditions and, and that we'd much rather be with their traditions and their civilization than this sort of crazy commercial um, uh, warlike, belligerent, uh, me, me, me civilization of, uh, 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 of the USA. And, y you know, we would, the, the irreverence of the 60s of, of um, um, uh, of, of Bob Dylan, you know, of saying, you know, sometimes the, the President of the United States has to stand naked. Um, uh, I mean, I was, I was certainly doing a lot of humorous things and, and writing humor and doing guerrilla theater. Um, um, and there was always, I would say, a political point to it of going uh, standing on a street corner in New York City and and taking out five dollar bills and one dollar bills and setting fire to money on the streets or 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 running a pig for president of the United States, you know. Well, thank you. I I know we have one, a guest speaker whom we're going to hear voices of the 1960s. So we're going to conclude at this moment. Would you please join me in giving a really warm Applause to our panelists.